Um, our medium is the 21st century's favorite medium, the internet. And we are based not in an office, but virtually at www.thinklegalbangladesh.com. Um, it was founded a few years ago by two very forward-thinking individuals, one of whom is um, standing right there. I don't know why she is not sitting. Uh, she is one of our distinguished guests, Ms. Anita Ghazi Rahman and uh, Mr. Masood Khan, who is not here with us today. Um, since its inception, we have been able to obtain and upload to our website um, more than a couple of hundred unreported judgments, uh, the Honorable Mr. Justice Syed Rafat Ahmed. We are also very honored to have uh, Barrister Mustafizur Rahman Khan. The topic of today's lecture is deconstructing judicial independence. I cannot, I cannot help but reflect upon the poignancy of today's topic. A very learned and distinguished former Chief Justice of Bangladesh has passed away, Mr. Justice Mustafa Kamal. And as a matter of fact, his Kulkhani is uh, scheduled to be held this afternoon which is one of the reasons, and many of the persons who are uh, assembled here today are also invited to that particular program and would be expecting to leave this program to attend that program. So for that reason, uh, it would be better if we keep our uh, program within certain confines of uh, time. And for that reason, I do not propose to speak for a great length of time. But nonetheless, I mentioned that uh, uh, there I reflect upon today's topic with a sense of poignancy. This is because Mr. Justice Mustafa Kamal was the, one of the author judges of the Mazdar Hussein judgment, which established the independence of the lower judiciary in Bangladesh. I also am intrigued by the topic in, in as much that it uses the words deconstructing. Deconstruction is a word which I am most familiar with in the, term, in the context of modern gastronomy where they actually deconstruct the ingredients of a particular item of food and uh, present it in its deconstructed form with the particular ingredients of a traditional dish in its separate form. So I'm really intrigued and I look forward to what Mr. Justice Sayed Rifat Ahmed a very distinguished judge of our Supreme Court has to say about the topic. So without further ado, may I welcome Mr. Justice Sayyid Rifat Ahmed to present his lecture. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mustafa Zuraman Khan. I wasn't quite prepared to sort of serve up gastronomical delights this afternoon, but I hope I can come close to that. Um, peer judge of the Supreme Court, uh, members of the legal fraternity, Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I dedicate this presentation to the late Chief Justice Mustafa Kamal, whom I consider to be one of the greater South Asian judges bred in true common law tradition. This presentation comprises of an analysis of the philosophical base the internal workings and the assumptions implicit in the notion of judicial independence. To that end, I have attempted to analyze by deconstruction core concepts that are important constituents of that notion of independence. The objective will not necessarily be to draw firm deductions of the ideal arrangement through which this is to be achieved, Rather, the aim here is to chart certain pathways, the pursuit of which shall necessarily be informed by one's own experience as a stakeholder, and there are many stakeholders in this exercise, in the judiciary remaining a functional, and this is very important, a relevant, if not indispensable, organ of the state. If one is to look for an all-encompassing definition of judicial independence, one may look no further than that found in the UN, UN basic principles on the independence of the judiciary. And th this is what it says. 
The judiciary shall decide matters before them impartially on the basis of facts and in accordance with the law without any restrictions, improper influences, inducements, pressures, threats or interferences, direct or indirect, from any quarter or for any reason. The terms that we find in that definition like influences, pressures and interference come to be inextricably linked with any mention of the independence of the judiciary. These notions, as are correlative to forces external to the judiciary and the extent to which they may bear on the discharge of judicial functions, in the ultimate analysis, determine the extent to which the judiciary may act impartially, free of bias, prejudice, fear, and other extrajudicial compulsions and constraints in an ideal constitutional structuring are intended to operate as checks and balances on each other as governed by an overarching aim of separation of powers. That view entails the necessity for each branch or organ to discharge its functions responsibly and with restraint. Experience, however, shows that such restraint is rather elusive at times, requiring therefore concerted and deliberate efforts at regulating such separation. Indeed, that objective, as is the bedrock of a constitutional democracy founded on the rule of law, is best exemplified, for example, in our jurisdiction by Article 22 of the Constitution, as enjoins upon the state to ensure the separation of the judiciary from the executive organs of the state. But also by reason of being vested, at least in our jurisdiction, with the authority to decide on the constitutionality of legislation. Chief Justice Mustafa Kamal's observation in the Mazdar Hussain case emphasizes that unique functional status of both the superior and subordinate judiciaries thus. And this is what he said. The Supreme Court and the subordinate courts are the repository of judicial power of the state. Functionally and structurally, judicial service stands on a different level from the civil administrative executive services of the Republic. The judiciary, therefore, is an independent arm. This is just as Mustafa Kamal again. Is an independent arm of the Republic which sits on judgment over parliamentary, executive and quasi-judicial actions, decisions, and orders. The state's compulsions within such a constitutional framework, again as ours, and of course in other constitutional frameworks as well, is to ensure elasticity in the inter-organ relationship, ensuring that a lone organ does not unduly and disproportionately benefit from an imbalance of power causing such tenuous but essential linkages between them to irreparably snap. Predetermined standards of separation and independence trickling down from the realms of international law down to municipal legal regimes as objective determinants of the mode of ensuring independence and sufficiency of the same prove to be important considerations in an exercise as the one we've undertaken today. The UN basic principles on the independence of the judiciary, the Bangalore principles of judicial conduct of 2002, and the Commonwealth Latimer House principles on the three branches of government 2003, together form the international legal regime premise for this particular presentation. These have been selected from amongst a plethora of similar other international law declarations, charters, and opinions, etc., and are found best to reflect international and regional ge general consensus on the governing philosophy and the plan of action in this regard. International standards necessarily stand to be evaluated and applied in municipal regimes primarily, primarily through political will, but more significantly as shepherded by 
the concerned judiciary itself. While separation from the other organs of branches of government remains the preliminary objective of independent functioning, it definitely is not the sole determinant of judicial strengthening. External institutional separation additionally demands complementary internal initiatives spearheaded by the judiciary itself. The purpose here is to ensure autonomy of action and secure the corollary objective of being transparent and credible in the delivery of quality justice. This, in turn, takes into account the interests of the yet another broad category of stakeholders in the quest for judicial independence. That is, the public in general and litigants, legal representatives, court staff, various public interest groups, etc. in particular. This motley group, I would argue, remains a key stakeholder in determining not only the level of, or degree of independence attainable, but also the extent to which an autonomous judiciary must strive to remain accountable to these individuals and groups as constitute its main constituents to justify its very existence. This is precisely where the element of public trust or confidence in the delivery of justice emerges as a component at informing, engaging the sufficiency of the services provided by an independent and impartial justice delivery system. Autonomy and independence therefore emerge as interdependent constituents of a regime of judicial empowerment. Article 14 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights perhaps best encapsulates the duality of pur purpose of judicial independence in stating that all persons are equal before the courts and tribunals and that all persons are entitled to a fair and public hearing before a competent, independent, and impartial tribunal established by law. This, therefore, lays the groundwork for drawing a distinction between institutional independence, that is constitutionally or statutorily declared, and judicial autonomy of action in the efficient and transparent delivery of justice. That is, the mutually complementary yet distinct notions of constituting the judiciary and the functioning of the judiciary. You would note that the latter, that of the autonomous functioning of the judiciary, presupposes constitutional latitude at judicial self-governance by internally framed rules and regulations, as envisaged, for example, in Article 107.1 of the Bangladesh Constitution. <coughs> Institutional independence, coupled with the concept of accountability, demands the mode of appointment of judges, regulation of tenure of service, and the disciplining of justices to be free of executive and legislative interference. Governing standards of accountability endorse a code of ethics and conduct devised and implemented by the judiciary to gauge accountability, for example, through establishment of a credible independent judicial ethics review committee, and to enforce disciplinary measures through bodies or tribunals as are independent and impartial. Here, the preferred mode of oversight and regulation is one of collegiate authority in the form of, say, a judicial council or a judiciary council with majority representation from the judiciary. While lay representation on such bodies or councils as are assigned independent and deliberative powers of appointments and disciplines remains almost universally recommended, it is important to note that the degree of political representation in such bodies is either envisaged to be minimal or indeed emphatically reduced to none at all. Given these objectives of attaining independence, autonomy, and accountability, broadly stated, the question remains, 
How then best to achieve these? Is there one panacean mechanism that can immediately be served up as a potent elixir? Or is the process more evolutionary? In nature, brought about by trial and error with a large dose of vision and fortitude admixed. Pragmatists will in all probability argue for the latter pathway, the evolutionary mechanism of trial and error. The state's constitutional and statutory initiatives at separation must unavoidably vary according to its own constitution political framework. Indeed, inherent institutional strengths like self-restraint on the part of the judiciary and earnestness inculcated over time through trial and error at securing independent judicial functioning may arguably deter a politicized appointment and removal procedure, as is uniquely the American experience, to slide irreversibly into the depths of constitutional anarchy. But far overwhelming is the apprehension that in similar such systems, based on weaker institutional strengths, the notion of separation of powers remains elusive and fraught with risks of upsetting the inter-institutional balance. The argument in this, that scenario is for elements of independence to be constitutionally, legally, and institutionally formalized to delineate clearly spheres of judicial function free of executive and legislative interference. The question of constitutionally entrenched notion of separation of powers and with the additional concomitant concept of the supremacy of the law or the constitution. Interesting still, I mean that was the American expense, uh, experience I cited, but interesting still are examples of the notion of judicial independence being revisited in mature democratic orders with a, already equipped with a keen sense of constitutionalism to equip these orders um, and the judiciary in particular with greater parity with the judiciary's other correlative organs being the executive and the legislative. And here the United Kingdom serves as a relevant example. The UK Constitutional Reform Act of 2005 with, many of, with which many of you are familiar remains a notable exercise in ushering in the substance of institutional separation and clothing the judiciary with powers at public engagement and exposure without, however, sacrificing the spirit of commonality of purpose between the three organs of state. Further, pragmatism dictates such institutional separation not to be shown off or informed by a complete severance of institutional linkages. The separation of powers does not necessarily translate into a silo mentality or strictly compartmentalized spheres of operation devoid of all inter-organ linkages as necessary for the administration of justice. Institutional separation, doubling for independence, remains markedly highlighted under the Act of 2005 by the replacement of the Lord Chancellor by the Lord Chief Justice, the creation of the Supreme Court, and the setting up of the Judicial Appointments Commission. While the essential role of the Lord Chancellor as the only conduit between the judiciary and the executive has been done away with, channels of formal linkages between the judiciary and the other two organs have otherwise been opened up afresh and anew. Very interesting. The biannual meetings of the Lord Chief Justice and the Prime Minister monthly meetings of the Lord Chief Justice with the Chancellor, the appearance of the Lord Chief Justice and the President of the Supreme Court before the House of Lords Constitution Committee, an appearance of judges frequently as expert witnesses before parliamentary committees to determine future course of legislative action are at once innovative and essential. These linkages ensure that an independent judiciary empowered and buoyed by the formation of Judicial Appointments Commission, Judicial Appointments and Conduct Ombudsman, and the Judicial Court Investigations Office, for example, remains confident 
in forging working relationships with its two other partners in government without any constraints or relinquishing its independence. The legislative intervention in the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005 serves as a good example of institutional independence being bolstered by autonomous functioning of the judiciary. Thus, the institutional segregation is complemented by a more equitable reordering of the judiciary's internal administration, most notably in the setting up of the Judicial Executive, Executive Board that acts as a cabinet to the judiciary. The Act additionally sees to the devolution of powers greater than ever before, with leadership roles assigned specifically to judges at all levels of the judicial hierarchy. The judiciary as a whole therefore assumes collective role of a collegial body led by the Lord Chief Justice, both in administering its own affairs and in engaging with the executive and the legislative organs actively and positively. I would argue that such autonomy as we find in the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005 um, has both a managerial and substantive aspect to it. Of the former, the managerial uh, uh, angle, perhaps the Singaporean example of seminal transformational changes introduced in its subordinate judiciary by translating the vision of a former Chief Justice is the most notable. That is because it represents ideally how a formerly sluggish system, reactive and remedial in nature, has remarkably transformed itself to presently one based wholly on preemptive approach to justice de delivery with capacity to anticipate change and innovate. The three essential determinants of this dynamic Singaporean example at judicial strengthening are, one, the accountability of the judiciary to its main constituents, that is, the public at large based on the philosophy that anybody in distress must be granted quick and, inex and inexpensive relief. And to that end, the judiciary has to transform from a court-centric to a service-centric institution. Two, that this entails a commitment to provide quality adjudication, comprehensive services, and expanded or diversionary alternatives distinct from the adversary, adversarial trial system, and to that end incorporates innovative exploration and implementation of a wide range of ADR options. And three, a continuous rethinking of the leadership role generally within the judiciary, and particularly the assignment to judges, the roles of managers, reformers, and educators and that of entrepreneurs and technopreneurs to court officials. That purely managerial view of conducting judicial affairs must, as I alluded to earlier, must necessarily be considered further against the substantive role played by common law judges in particular, as in our instance, in molding and expanding the contours of law. That raises the specter, however, of an unelected organ of state, as in our jurisdiction, challenging or overawing the other branches of government while still operating within its capacious bounds. Indeed, self-imposed constraints as regards to stare decisis, the tradition of orality requiring judicial functions to be conducted in public, and the delivery of judgments in open court, for example, have over the ages, with necessary transmutations, continued to operate as internal constraints at judicial activity inuring both to the benefit of transparency and accountability of action. This, I submit, ties in com comfortably with a Republican constitution as ours, a Republican Constitution's self-declared supremacy as a manifestation of the will of the people in whom the powers of the Republic in turn vest. 
That sense of republicanism is clearly evident in the judicial authority under Article 44 of our Constitution for the High Court Division to act as an agency for enforcement of fundamental rights. An enjoyment in Article 112 of all authorities, albeit the executive and the judicial, not the legislative, to act in aid of the Supreme Court, to name a few of the provisions of our Republican Constitution. That argument, that point of view, brings us to the issue of the authority in which vests the constitutional sanction to expect and extract judicial accountability and the predetermined values against which that accountability has to be gauged. The need, but the dilemma, to identify the primary authority to which the judiciary must submit is well encapsulated in the following excerpt from the distinguished appellate court judge and academic Richard A. Posner. Posner's observations, one notes, on the American judiciary does, however, allow for general deductions to be made. And this is what Posner says, and I quote, when the principal is the government and the agent a judge employed by it, the problem of agency costs is acute because the government lacks the usual levers by which to procure an agent's fidelity in the principal's interests. A related question is who a federal judge's principal is or indeed whether there is one in a meaningful sense. Is it the judges of a higher court? But then who are the principals of the judges of the highest court? If the principals are not the other judges, are they the members of Congress? The president who appointed the judges, the current president, the American people, the framers of the Constitution, the Constitution itself, or statutes and precedents. But can documents be principles? The law? And then Posner says, whatever the answers, make no mistake, at the end of the day, no society leaves its judges completely at large. Posner's dilemma presents itself, as he himself notes, in agency costs to be extracted by the government from the functioning of the judiciary, subject, however, to an adequate evaluation of due judicial performance, leading to the principal and agent's interests to converge and coincide. But such evaluation, proving difficult in the realm of independent functioning of the judiciary, Posner himself raises the option of better assessing the quality of the judiciary's performance on the basis of its output. Here, observables, observables such as backlog, reversal rates, timeliness, judicial demeanor, etc., emerge as important determinants of performance to the satisfaction of the chief's court's chief constituents, that is, again, the public at large, the people. Indeed, it is not uncommon for systems to employ mechanisms as we do in our, case, in, in our jurisdiction as well, uh, in discharging the High Court's statutory, uh, constitutional responsibility to oversee the functioning of the subordinate judiciary. And these are the mechanisms we employ. Our employ uh, we employ mechanisms of oversight based on quantitative criteria or other performance measures. Here, the Bangalore principles are critical in that they represent standardized crit criteria of values for evaluating judicial performance. And now we visit the Bangalore principles. The Bangalore principles in acknowledging that the UN basic principles on the independence of the judiciary are addressed directly to states. Instead addresses itself directly, the Bangalore principles, these are directed to the judiciary straight directly in providing with three primary objectives. One, provide a framework to judges and the judiciary for ethical judicial conduct. Two, assist members of the executive and the legislature and lawyers and the public in general in better understanding and aiding the judiciary. 
And three, ensure that judges remain accountable for their conduct to appropriate institutions as are themselves independent and impartial. It's something I referred to earlier, that these bodies must have, this is, these, are, these are the emerging international standards now, that there is consensus that these bodies must have majority judicial representation, can have some lay representation, but with minimal or no political representations at all. In fact, I think the Bangalore Principles is emph emphatic about completely negating the possibility of any political representation on these bodies. Predicated on these objectives, the core values of the judiciary, as are identified in the Bangalore Principles, being independence, impartiality, integrity, propriety, and competence and diligence have emerged as the six core Bangalore principles supplemented by implementation mechanisms extensively devised as annexed to the, the, the Bangalore principles. Spurred by these principles, many jurisdictions in the Asia Pacific region now appreciate not only the necessity to develop judicial institutional strength and hence autonomy bolstered by politically independent appointment and disciplinary mechanisms, but critically vesting in the members of the public or non-judicial stakeholders a central role in devising guidance of judicial conduct. This, in my view, provides as complete and wholesome an example of securing transparent accountable and fair administration of justice as one may ever hope for. Indeed, this serves as the most practical check on a willful judiciary otherwise going astray. The philosophy behind engaging the public, so, is a simple one. And that is the judiciary itself may not necessarily be the best judge of its own conduct and can be aided considerably by public perception in this regard. The secondary objective here being of non-judicial stakeholders acquiring a better understanding of mores of judicial conduct and engage on much more realis realistic terms than would otherwise be the case with the judiciary. The evolving contours of judicial independence and autonomy, as we have discussed uh, above, require us here to adopt a more nuanced approach with regard to the concept of the rule of law. A more empowered and independent judiciary is better placed to interpret and explore the evolving frontiers of the rule of law beyond the basic constituents of enactment of law by a duly elected legislature, and interpretation and application of the law by an independent and impartial judiciary. There's more to the concept of rule of law as we now see it. It comes to mind now that Tom Bingham, the former Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, noted in his compelling work, The Rule of Law, that the draftsman's, uh, the, the draftsman's notable om omission of an otherwise he was expecting a very pithy definition of rule of law in the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005. He couldn't find one. Then he had to double guess, you know, what the judicial of uh, the legislative intent was, and this is what he thinks happened. I think they, the Parliament, recognized the extreme difficulty of devising a pithy definition suitable for inclusion in a statute as this. Better by far, they, again Parliament, might reasonably have thought to omit a definition and leave it to the judges to rule on what the term means if and when the question arises for decision. In this way, he says, Tom Bingham, a definition could be forged not in the abstract but with reference to particular cases and it would, possibly, and it would be possible for the concept to evolve over time in response to new ideas and situations. For me, 
perhaps I see the absence of a definition of the rule of law, nothing to take away nothing from what the Lord Chief Justice has said above. I see the absence of definition of rule of law in the Act of 2005 as an evidence of the paradigmatic shift in the renegotiated positioning of the judiciary within the British scheme of separation, premised as it is on parliamentary sovereignty. We see a shift away from that notion, absolute notion of parliamentary sovereignty taking place in the United Kingdom. And I think that the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005 is an important first step in that regard. Bringing, in fact, the, the, uh, the British system closer to what we have in an entrenched constitution in this jurisdiction. Bingham, in fact, sees that no notion of parliamentary supremacy getting frayed at the edges, given the concern that, as he observes, and he, this is what he says, the power to restrain legislation favored by a clear majority of the commons has become much weakened, even if exceptionally such legislation were to infringe the rule of law. He therefore foresees the long established constitutional settlement in the United Kingdom becoming unbalanced, requiring a serious consideration of the problem that may very well give rise to undesirable conflict between the legislative and the judiciary. And he, I think the Constitutional Reform Act is a step towards obviating the necessity to address such conflicts to arise in the future. Understandably, the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005 restores a balance that is less elusive, for example, in systems as ours, sustained by an entrenched constitution. That entrenchment, declaratory of the supremacy of the constitution and the concomitant authority of the judiciary to decide on the constitutionality of any law is best encapsulated in Article 6 of the American Constitution as provided. And it says, the constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made, under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the constitutional laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. That enthronement of the law, I think, uh, <laughs> I think it was not, it, Bingham speaks of the enthronement of the law in the American Constitution. It is evident, clearly places the independent judicial functioning and interpreting and applying of the law to be at the forefront of separation of powers in our constitutional regime. We have everything that Article 6 speaks of. And there is nothing to convince us that it should be otherwise. Indeed. The constituents of the rule of law, note that rule of law is not, either the concept of rule of law remains undefined in our constitution as well. It appears in the preamble, it appears in various other provisions of the constitution, but there is no definition of rule of law in our constitution. But that is what we are to uphold in our determination, uh, in determining what the will of the people is as reflected in the constitution. Indeed, the constituents of the rule of law are readily discernible in the supremacy of the Constitution, in our uh, case, as the solemn expression of the will of the people, Article 7. And notably in the separation of the judiciary from the ex executive, Article 22. These provisions, I would argue, clearly attest to an independent and autonomously functioning judiciary submitting only to the popular will reflected in the Constitution itself, while sitting in judgment over legislative, executive, and quasi-judicial actions, decisions, and orders, as Justice Mustafa Kamal observed in the Mazdar Hassan case. The Republican moorings of our Constitution are therefore undeniable, as is its potential for aiding a better understanding 
of judicial independence and autonomy under our constitutional dispensation. And the Republican moorings, the Republican complexion of the Constitution, I think, remains underappreciated by the judiciary itself. It needs to be probed further as to how far it can take us to reshape our vision and our perception of what the rule of law should be in the 21st century. Even given such constitutional certainties as we are blessed with, however, we in this jurisdiction would be unduly complacent and myopic in indefinitely nurturing a straight-jacketed view of achieving and sustaining judicial independence and autonomy. Jurisdictions around the world today are readily adapting to altered realities, burgeoning expectations, and self-realizations at serving not only as an organ of the state, but as a relevant one. Our challenge is, the challenge that we face as an organ and as a fraternity, all of us, is whether 50 years from now, as we are progressing, will we still be relevant as an organ of the state? We can still remain an organ of the state, but will we be overwhelmingly relevant? That's an immense challenge. To that end, visionaries continue to guide the strengthening of the judiciary robustly renegotiating its relationships with the other competing organs and engaging more beneficially with its constitutional and natural constitu constituency, the general public. It is my hope that this presentation has served the purpose of acquainting us with the new reality of the significantly greater role assigned to a more assertive, institutionally empowered, forward-looking judiciary exposed to greater scrutiny than ever before and being much the stronger for it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience. Um, before I hand over the floor to Mr. Mustafa Rahman Khan, a note of thanks uh, to the uh, Think Legal team in general and uh, Ms. Anita Ghazi Rahman and Mr. Sakib Mehboob, in particular, in initiating this lecture series. And I wish you all the best in all your future endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Justice Syed Rafat Ahmed. Judges should be free from influence in discharging their judicial functions. But beyond this general notion of what the independence of judiciary is, our understanding of the topic in Bangladesh, certainly from the point of view of somebody who is essentially a practicing lawyer, is one which is informed by anecdotal experience, by the perceptions and personalities which are involved. And it is in that context that I personally have found today's lecture an eye-opening one. It is an eye-opening one because it provides us with a conceptual and an analytical framework within which we can approach the issue of independence of judiciary in a dispassionate way, in a way which is not obscured by partisan considerations, but one which is very relevant. I am very grateful to Mr. Justice Syed Refat Ahmed for citing practical example, drawing upon other jurisdictions, in particular the United Kingdom and Singapore, in giving us examples to which we can look in approaching this issue in Bangladesh. Obviously, we will not replicate what has been done in other countries, but certainly we may draw upon those examples in deciding how we should approach this issue. I'm grateful to Mr. Justice Syed Refat Ahmed for drawing attention to, for instance, the external and the internal aspect. The external aspect is one which I understand is informed by the constitutional and statutory measures which 
are designed to protect the independence of the judiciary. But the internal aspects are the measures that the judiciary itself can take in order to ensure that it functions independently. I personally have found it immensely refreshing to see a judge of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh speak in terms of institutional linkages. He has drawn examples. He, he has cited as an example what is happening in Britain. On the one hand, institutionally, the judiciary is being made separate. On the other hand, institutional forums are being established in order to formalize the linkages between the judiciary and the other organs of government. This is something which I personally find refreshing, reassuring, and I'm sure the younger members of the bar will find it encouraging that a judge of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh is so modern in his outlook. And this is something which I hope will find resonance amongst his colleagues. He has shown to me that being independent does not mean that a judge has to be or has to be made aloof. You have to, the prospect of involving members of the judiciary in legislative reform, for instance, is something which has not been reflected upon in our institutional framework so far, but it is about time that it should be. Mr. Justice Sayed Refat Ahmed, I assume, because of his position, has deliberately refrained from endeavoring to relate the experience of other jurisdictions to Bangladesh because of the sensitiveness of his position. That challenge, I believe, he has left for the younger persons who are present here to take up. The challenge is for you to find out ways in which institutional development may occur in Bangladesh in order to shore up and ensure the independence of the judiciary. In this process, apart from the various points of references that you will find in his lecture, I would like to add two small aspects which you may also consider bearing in mind. One is the role of the bar. Those of us who are members of the bar have heard from our seniors about certain long established conventions with respect to the administration of, for instance, the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. We have also heard them lament about how these long established conventions are not being adhered to partly because of certain external influences upon that process. As a member of the Supreme Court Bar Association, I feel that it is incumbent upon the leadership of the bar now, at this point of time, to address this issue in a very frank and dispassionate way, without being infected by the disease of partisanship which afflicts our polity. I hope that the younger members of the bar who are present here will take up this issue in a more proactive way with their seniors. The other aspect which I think we should also look into is something about which I have had some personal experience recently with varying degrees of success. It is the law of contempt. In Bangladesh, it seems that it has become a bit difficult to be frank in criticizing the judiciary. Of course, there are certain limits, certain lines which are to be drawn. I hope that in the near future, an occasion will come for the Supreme Court of Bangladesh to clearly delineate 
the boundary between what is permitted and what is permissible uh, and what is not. Surely there is room for robust yet dispassionate criticism of the judiciary and the judicial institutions. Finally, I hope that the bar will be up to the challenge because I am sure it will be available in the internet as a resource. Academics not only focused in the field of law, but also in political science, also in jurisprudence, will have occasion to return to it even five years from now, ten years from now, as a point of reference in identifying when free, frank, dispassionate academic discussion on this issue began in Bangladesh in the 21st century. What remains for me right now to do is to thank Anita and Sakip for, and the other members of the Think Legal team for organizing this wonderful program. Personally for me, it has been a very humbling experience. I'm also very grateful for to Sakib for mentioning certain kind words about me on account of having been his teacher in the past. One of, uh, personally for me, what is much more rewarding than any attainment that I have had in the legal profession is to see so many of my students doing so brilliantly well at the bar. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.